Welcome to Smarter Circuits. I'm your host, Ian Klein. This video is the second of a three-part episode on Shelly Relay's MQTT and various homebrew methods of controlling circuits in your home. If you want to watch the introduction to this episode or learn about wiring Shelly Relays, setting up an MQTT server on a Raspberry Pi, and creating a Flask API to make control easier, you may want to watch part one, you know, in numeric order. The touchscreen program and web interface will both require one or both endpoints defined in that video, though you may be able to glean the data structure from usage. Also, the code from all three videos will be available after the next video is published next week. Let's begin. First, create a file called monitor.py. Then, we'll import Paho MQTT client. We'll create an instance of our client and start our program. Now we'll register our message handler, which we'll write here in a moment. We'll give it the client, user data, and message, although we'll only use the message. We'll come back to that. Connect our client to our MQTT server. Subscribe to all Shelley's subtopics. The hash is a wildcard. We'll start the client loop. Then we'll create our own loop that we can interrupt by setting running to false. We'll sleep for one second here, though you can do other tasks here too. Let's import time. We'll import JSON and OS while we're here. Going back, let's signal the client loop to stop if we fall out of our loop. Now we'll write our message handler logic. First, we'll decode the payload. Then we'll break our topic up in order to extract the address. Let's create a property based on any topic that can come in and assign it to our flat object. This is especially helpful if the manufacturer adds anything new for us to use later. We won't have to worry about it here necessarily. We'll make a file name that we can search for later. Now we'll check to see if the file exists and load it into the state object if it does. If it doesn't, we'll create an empty object. Now we'll assign the payload value of the message to the property of the object. We can save our state object now. Before I forget, we should disconnect our client before the program exits. Save, exit, and run the script. That's it. Like the API, our service isn't really a service right now, and also like the API, this can be done a few different ways that I'm not going to cover. But I will put a link to more information in the description. One thing I will note is that you should do some homework on what happens during the Raspberry Pi boot process to ensure your scripts start reliably. Now we can start building ways to use the circuit and what we know about it. First, I'll build a simple touchscreen interface with Python. There are certainly better ways to go about this, but this gets the job done. For those who paid close attention in the last video, I am not a Python programmer. I primarily use C Sharp and now Java at work. I'm also primarily a back-end developer, so don't get too judgy when we get to the single-page application. Create a file called touchcontrol.py. Import tkinter as tk, import time, requests, and json. Now we'll start our program.
we'll create a window, get the width from our screen, and the height. Then we'll set the attribute full screen to one. Set the geometry to our resolution. Configure background black. Now we can configure our columns. I'm going to create three equal sized columns. These are zero indexed. Give it the min size width divided by three. We'll do this two more times. All right, now let's create a global variable to store our circuit name. That way we can use the same code for other touch panels. We'll add a label to our interface. Give it a font. Background black. Foreground white. And then we'll put our label on the grid. Rows and columns are zero indexed, so column one is the center. Uh, we want this to stick to all sides. We'll pad it. And then we're on to the on button. And create the on button. Give it a on click method. We'll define here a little bit. Give it a font. Give it a background and a foreground. Now we'll place the button on the grid. Row one, center column, make it stretch if it needs to, pad it. We'll create our off button, give it text off, command, set the font, background and foreground. Now we'll put the off button on the grid, row two, center column, make it stretch, give it padding. Now we'll place the close button. This way we can close out of our interface. Make that one a little smaller. And then foreground and background. Or background and foreground. Then we'll place the close button on the grid. And we're going to put this one in column two so that it's off to the right. So you don't accidentally hit it and close the interface when you don't mean to. And now we'll start our loop. Now let's go ahead and define our click methods. Close is easy. And then we'll create a method to send a command to our API. Wrap this in a try. Send a get request to our API. Pass in our command variable. And if it fails, we'll just ignore it. Now in the on click, we send the on command, and in the off click, we send the off command. Look everything over. Looks good. And now we'll run it and test it.
OK, we can operate our circuit now, see its power usage, and even tell if the relay is healthy. Let's replicate some of this functionality in a more accessible way. One thing worth noting is that I had originally considered using a web interface that simply opened on startup so I could easily make a nicer display for the touchscreens, and it's still something I might try later on, but this requires very little intermediary software, like the browser, and it's not awful in my opinion. There's other arguments for either approach, and I don't think either is right or wrong, but I wanted to mention it as food for thought. This is the end of part two of the episode on Shelly Relays, MQTT, Python, Angular, and the Raspberry Pi. The third and final part of this video will be available next week. I do hope you've enjoyed the series so far, and of course, if you did enjoy it and haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the channel. If you want to know what's going on between episodes, you can follow Smarter Circuits on Twitter at Circuits Smarter, and if you'd like to help make more and better videos possible, consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page linked below. Thanks for listening to me ramble, and I do hope you'll join me for part three as we continue building Smarter Circuits.